Good morning, welcome to Trading R. I'm Sonal Bhutra and with me is Pavitra Parikh. Sonia will also be with us in just a bit. Good morning, Pavitra. Good morning. Uh, well, after a stellar rally that we saw yesterday in the Mura trading session, which was of course on low volume. Yeah. So uh, markets today have come off from the highs of the day. At the day's low, we are sitting with cuts of around 28 points at a 100 point uh, downtick from the highs. And some of these consumption names, the likes of HUL, Britannia, Titan, all of them are at the day's low and that is something which is pushing Nifty towards the lower end. And we also have Reliance Industries, a mixed set of numbers, weaker on the O2C front and that is something that is impacting earnings as we speak. But uh, looks like mid-cap index, it is there for the taking. That one is up around 62 points. But we'll have to really see because it's the penultimate day before the monthly expiry, Pavitra. Let's see which way things go. Let's see. It, I'm sure it's going to be an interesting session. You know, also the banks today are uh, seeing some red. Of course, you do have some which fared very well in their earnings season, the likes of ICICI Bank. But something like a Kotak is under pressure right now. You also have access in this. In a lot of the smaller banks, so the likes of RBL um, and IDFC first, which are sort of really adding some pressure. What's doing well? It is some of the auto names which are really holding up well today. So whether it's Maruti, Aisha, a few of those are up on your screen. Those ones are looking quite good. And some of the tech names also holding up. Remember, this week could be a lot about tech because in the US, a lot of the bigger tech companies are posting earnings this week. So those ones are up on your screen. So this week could be a lot about tech. But uh, let's see how things go from here. And Sonia is also with us now. So Sonia, it uh, looks like it'll be an interesting session. Very interesting session, you know, and uh, as you said, a lot of the big tech earnings are coming out later yeah. in the day, later in the week in the US markets as well. But all guns blazing for now, right? I mean, you do have uh, the markets in largely firm fettle and beneath the surface, although the Nifty has given up a tad bit of its gains, it's still holding on to that 17,700 mark. So let's kickstart the show on that note and tell you what's lined up. Uh, first up, stock slip after a strong opening for the truncated trading week. FMCG and utilities lead the gain. While autos and capital goods eke out gains, we'll discuss the way forward for the market with NJ Kumar, the Managing Director of Prime Securities. It's earnings galore on the show today, so we will be joined by the managements of Glenmark Life, Make Money Organics to discuss their quarterly numbers and the outlook going forward. IDFC First Bank and RBL Bank are losing a trade after their quarterly results. Complete earnings fine print coming up on the show. All this and much more in the next 60 minutes as well. All right, so clearly we have a lot lined up on this show. We're going to get to all of that. But first up, an important story that we're just getting. The government is walking a tight fiscal rope. We learned that the buoyant tax receipts may not be enough to cover the FI23 additional expenditure as well as non-tax revenue gap. So Sapna is picking up all of this information from our sources and joins us now with the details. Sapna. Hi, so absolutely right. Uh, this is what the situation could be at the moment. Of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost the entire H2 uh, uh, still pans out. So we'll have to wait and watch and see how the uh, government finances work out. But at the moment, uh, you know, you need to understand probably the demands that are coming in in the area, the budget meetings ongoing in the ministry right now, uh, you know, those demands, I mean, indicated and some of them have been there since, uh, uh, you know, the H1 of the current financial year as well. So maybe around three odd lakh crore or slightly over that would be the number uh, in terms of the demands that are coming in. Uh, plus, a bit of a concern could also be on the non-tax revenue side. Uh, you know, there, there are no clear estimates as of now uh, what the RBI dividend could look like. And there is, of course, going to be a gap on the disinvestment side as well. So that coupled with, along with the additional expenditure uh, is something that uh, you know the government is grappling with. Uh, of course, uh, tax revenues have been more than buoyant, both direct and indirect. And uh, particularly on the direct side, we're able to understand that they may actually grow by around 30 odd percent in the current FI. But the feel as of now within the government is that that may not be sufficient uh, you know, to basically uh, maintain that 6.4. And hence, some kind of rationalization, quote unquote, in expenditures very likely they will not touch the big schemes, the big expenditure ticket items like you know your Manrega, your food, fertilizer. All of that is uh, uh, is, is a is, is a strict commitment. But there could be a lot of slipping around in the smaller schemes and smaller demands that come in from the smaller ministries and departments. So that's something we'll have to wait and watch. Of course, those numbers will only be out at the budget. But that exercise is ongoing right now. And uh, there's also another uh, point that we all need to keep in mind. Look, this is uh, the FD is at 6.4. And from next year onwards up to FY26, the government has to reduce it to below 4.5. So that's going to be a challenge because then the reduction will have to be more than 50 basis points every year. And hence, the 6.4% target this year becomes very important. They can't afford to slip on that. As of now, there are absolutely, there's absolutely no indication that 
uh, there could be a deviation. Uh, but this is the situation as of now. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sapna, for that. So, government not seeking to deviate from its fiscal glide path, and that will be taken well by the street plan to bring down the fiscal deficit uh, to 4.5% by FY26. Thanks a lot for that. Well, a lot of banks are doing well today, many of them hitting fresh highs. Uh, so, just uh, take note of that. Bank of Baroda, Canra Bank, ICICI Bank, SBI, Federal Bank are all sitting at fresh highs uh, this morning. Uh, so that's a pocket that continues to gain traction. But let's invite the first corporate on trading hour today. Glenmark Life Sciences is in focus on the back of its second quarter earnings. The generic business was more or less steady, while the CDMO segment saw a sequential growth of 27%. To discuss the quarter gone by, we're joined by Yasir Ravji, who's the Managing Director and CEO of Glenmark Life Sciences. Yasir, uh, good morning and uh, happy Diwali to you, your entire team at Glenmark Life. Just wanted to start by asking you about the business from Glenmark Pharma. Over there, there's been a bit of a decline that we've seen in the numbers. Just take us through that and uh, what is the expectation as we move along to the second half of the fiscal? Okay, good morning to all of you and happy Diwali to you as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, basically we've had a pretty good quarter, I would say, right? Uh, we've had quarter on quarter growth, like you stated on the CDMO side. The challenge uh, that we've had with Glenmark Pharma, as you, if you recall, right, we had the COVID drug that contributed very significantly in uh, last year. And so there was a high base effect. But even if you take that away, there's still some degrowth on the Glenmark Pharma side. And uh, essentially, I, I would say it's just a little bit lesser demand, which, which I believe will come back in the next couple of quarters. And so that should take us to a pretty, uh, you know, uh, middle to... You know, I mean, it should take us to single-digit growth, high single-digit growth, and I mean, we're looking forward to that. Our external business has been very strong. We've had very good growth from Japan, from LATAM, from India, and uh, you know, so we've we've been firing pretty well on the external side of the business, uh, and that uh, will remain strong. So once the Glenmark Pharma business picks up a little bit, I think we'll be back into positive uh, territory again. Uh, Yasir, good morning and thanks for joining us. This is Pavitra. Uh, just two questions. First, how much does this COVID uh, part really contribute to your business from Glenmark Pharma? And also, how much uh, is Glenmark really as a percentage of sales for you right now? Okay, so right now it's dipped to below 30%. It's like 27, 28% okay. of our overall revenue. But last year it was 41%. Okay, okay, so that should give you a sense in terms of how much that has come down. Right, and it was largely on account of the COVID drug. Hmm. Okay. And so, how much I mean, do you expect it to move to? Uh, we should, for Glenmark Farmers business, we should be hovering around the 30, 32% mark this year, but then over time, it's only going to degrow hmm. uh, because uh, the sort of overlap in our portfolios is not very significant going forward. Okay. So we would we see that coming, but then the external business, like I said, is doing really well. Hmm. Okay, and so we expect that the overall we're going to see pretty significant growth going forward. By significant, can you quantify that in terms? Of I mean, the... long. I mean, midterm. I would say, uh, I would say that we will be in the mid-teens, low mm. teens to mid-teens, and that we should be able to sustain. This year might be a bit of a challenge because oh. we have that high base effect, mm. okay, and uh, the demand uh, apart from the COVID drugs needs to pick up, uh, and I believe it will pick up from whatever I can see now. So it is, it, it's going to be pretty good, but you know, that should take us into the mid single digit kind of mid to high single digit growth this year. Okay, mid to high single digits, uh, gr digit growth this year, that is in terms of revenue. What about margins? Because we were talking about supply side issues. At a point in time, you also said higher prices could impact your margins by say 2 to 3%. Have things normalized now? And in that scenario, uh, what would your margin band look like? So the margins, uh, look, we've seen the worst and we've still retained our margins, okay? I mean, we've been holding from 29% to 31% margins and we continue to do that. I mean, the big reason for that is not the external world, really. It's all the efficiency that we've built up mm. uh, in-house, okay? Because the world is still a crazy place, as you all know, right? <laughs> and we are dealing, we are dealing with, uh, you know, solvent prices that have come down a little bit, but there's energy prices that we also have to deal with. Certain raw materials have also gone up. So we've we worked a little bit with our customers to take up prices. That has helped. But then a lot of cost efficiency that we've been able to drive internally on energy, on solvent usage, 
you know, on better cost improved processes has all come handy for us to keep the margin. So I keep saying, well, even if the worst is not over, our margins are still going to remain intact. Around 28 okay. to 30 percent. Yeah, 28 to 30 percent. Okay, 28 to 30 percent margins. Uh, any impact of what's happening in Europe, uh, the disruption on demand, uh, how much as a percentage of your overall business comes from Europe? And what do you see as the way forward? So we get a good 25 to 30 percent of our business out of Europe. And the nice okay. thing is that demand is not slowed down at all. Okay. Okay. The only thing that we've had to do in, in these extremely cost sensitive markets is bring in a lot of cost improved processes. So while the volume doesn't change, the value does decline a little bit. And so there is a, an effect on our top line. The bottom line stays the same because we continue to retain you know, the, the margins in spite of the cost improvement, right? So we do the cost improvement, pass on that to the customer. And as a result of that, there's a bit of, you know, it, it just, it does depress the bottom line, uh, the top line a little bit yeah. and bottom line stays intact. Okay, uh, so that's how the Europe business is doing. Uh, from a demand side, we see good demand, mm -hmm. but we've got to help our customers too. But you since know, a large, uh, sure, since a large portion of your business comes from there, around 30%, when you say the top line would get impacted, what kind of an average growth are you looking at and how does it compare to the past, uh, to, to, to the pre-COVID time? So, so the Europe growth, right, would be in the mid to high single digit. But then we've got so much good growth coming out of Japan, out of Latin America, and out of India as well. So the, these three uh, markets are also very significant markets for us. And they are sort of doing much, much better than what even we had anticipated. So all that put together gives us a very good overall growth picture. However, we do have some cost pressures from customers, uh, you know, in the European region, which we have to pass. We, we've got to give them better costs so that they're able to compete at the front end. That's the, that's the way we sort of work with our customers and keep the business going. All right, Yasser, we got that. Thank you very much. We'll leave it at that today. So that is the management of Glenmark Life saying that, yes, they have seen some impact in terms of the business from Glenmark Pharma, largely on account of the COVID drug, but the rest of the business seems to be good. Europe might see an impact right now, and they are saying that that could compress the top line, but the rest of the geographies, LATAM, uh, Japan, etc., seem to be doing quite well. So that is the word coming in from Glenmark uh, Life. With that, we're going to slip into a short break now, but up next, as always, we shift focus to the world of commodities. We'll tell you what's going on. Manisha Gupta will join us with a quick update. India Bulls Housing Finance Limited announces a public issue of secured redeemable NCDs, offering coupon rate of up to 9.55% per annum and additional incentive of 0.25% per annum. Tranche 3 issue closes on Friday, 28th October. To subscribe, log on to indiabullshomeloans.com. For risk factors and more details, refer to the Tranche 3 prospectus available on the websites of SEBI, Stock Exchange Company and the lead managers. आपको फैलने से रोकना मुश्किल है पर नामुमकिन नहीं अब फायरवॉल टेक्नोलॉजी के साथ सेंचुरी प्लाई क्लब प्राइम आग से बचाए यू नो पीपल ऑफन आस्क मी वाई आई लेफ्ट माई स्टडी जॉब एट द कॉल सेंटर आई वॉन्टेड मोर आउट ऑफ लाइफ सो आई लॉन्च माई ओन स्टार्टअप डू यू वॉन्ट नो हाउ देन स्टार्ट अप योर ओन बिजनेस एज एन एल आई सी एजेंट यू वॉन्टेड वीव गॉट इट ग्रेट प्रोडक्ट जीरो इन्वेस्टमेंट लीडिंग ऑर्गेनाइजेशन and unlimited opportunities so are you ready yeah! now think big become an lic agent visit our website or contact your nearest lic branch this festival bring in nissan magnite big on dreams bold in passion beautiful in every drive rush to the nearest nissan dealership now What is the current status of our cyber robbery? Little bit playing tricks. Alluring them a little bit. Tempting them a little bit. After that, their all money will be ours. <laughs> our little awareness can stop their laughter and cunning tricks. Do not use unauthorized apps, unknown links and don't allow unsecured Wi-Fi connections. If something wrong happens, report the matter immediately on helpline numbers.
Welcome back with some pressure coming in from the banking index, but uh, that is about the markets. Let's shift focus to commodities now. Manisha is joining us now, and today we are focusing on steel, Manisha. We are because we have seen such a big sharp uh, correction in steel prices overnight by down by more than 2.5%. So much so that you have the steel prices now trading at a two-year lows in the international market. And there are a couple of reasons for the prices declining as well. You are looking at lower investment in the property sector in China. That has been a concern for some time, but it now is showing on on-ground demand as well. So the investment in this year is down by nearly 8%. And then apart from that, there also is a report from World Steel Association suggesting that this year demand will decline by 2.3% in the global markets there. It also has to do with the weak manufacturing activity that we have seen from Japan, US and European Union that continues to weigh on to most of these industrial metals. Having said that, the street will watch out for the third quarter US GDP data that comes in on Thursday and the new direction would come in from there. I also want to put on screen what the steel prices have done in this year until now. We open on a firm note and then we saw a high of 5200 but currently and this is the low for this year as well and the low for last two years also that we're just about holding 3600 yuan per ton in case of the steel prices there interestingly the kind of decline or the sell off that we have seen in commodities most of the global banks and brokerages are suggesting that you buy at these current levels a latest one from goldman sachs suggests that in the next 3 months commodities will give you 12.8% of a return 21% in 6 months and nearly 35% in the next 12 months they also have segregated it commodity wise and in the next 12 month their view is that energy will give you the maximum returns at around 46.7% base metals at 29% and precious metals should be in your portfolio Folio because here as well in the next 12 months 23 to 24% of gains is what they're expecting. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. So that's in the commodity space. But here's some important market opinion that's coming in uh, from Ramesh Damani. We spoke with him yesterday on the Mahurat session and his mood point was that we're going to be hitting new highs in very short order. So very optimistic on the markets. Listen in. We are hoping for a 10-year bull run in equities in India. Why would I buy gold which pays me no dividend? It won't even tickle me back. So uh, I'm very clear that I want to remain invested almost fully in equity. I don't even like FDs at this point because inflation may eat up into your returns out there. The railway PSUs, you know, you look at the basket of railway PSUs who acts because these are the blunt instruments the government is going to use in order to express their capital expenditure over the next few years. So I think there's a great opportunity in those stocks. There are four or five listed, I'll name them, but I'm not recommending any of them. Uh, Railtel, RVNL, uh, rights, uh, to name a few, IRFC, to name a few. I think we just go and study those. I mean, you know, you may not want to buy them, may want to buy them, that's a call. But I think as an analyst and as a value picker, you owe it to yourself to at least go through and study them. As someone else pointed out that to get a bad NPA cycle takes three, four years after a good NPA cycle. So, you know, I think uh, it may be a bit more popular, especially on television channels. But I think uh, it, it probably will make money for investors. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Trading R. For the market, we're now seeing around a 50-point cut in the Nifty. So we are at the low point of the day. The Nifty Bank has also sort of extended its losses. It's down 170 points. And a lot of these mid-cap banks are seeing some sharp cuts. So take a look at RBL, IDFC First Bank. All of these have seen some sharp cuts after their earnings. In fact, Ekta is standing by now to take us through their quarterly numbers. Ekta. Thanks. I'll start with RBL Bank. You know, the NII was up around 16 odd percent. The profit was also higher on account of a low base and was supported by the fact that provisions declined quite considerably, considerably to around 240 crores versus 650 crores. Net interest margins came in at around 4.5 versus 4.36 percent on a Q1Q basis. So there was some improvement there. But RBL Bank is really, uh, you know, reacting to its operating earnings, which have been impacted this quarter. So operating profit is down this time round by 25.8% on a year-on-year -year basis. It is the fifth quarter of a year-on-year -year decline when it 
comes to the operating profit. The bank, in fact, has guided for moderate growth in operating profit in the near term. Slippages also increased 812 crores versus 653 crores. Annualized slippage ratio is now above 5% for the company, for the bank, and the advances were around 12.5% on a year on year basis, which is lower in terms of the average that we've seen other banks report as well. The bank expects credit growth to remain around 15% for FY23. IDFC First Bank, NII up 32%, profit up uh, again on account of a low base to 266%, which was really aided by another income, uh, which was up 36%. Provisions, which were lower by around 11 odd percent on a year on year basis. Again, for this one, the operating profit probably disappointed a little bit because it was up close to 69% on a year on year basis and slippages continued to remain elevated at around 1100 crores plus. Uh, annualized slippage ratio. 3.5% for the bank this quarter. Ekta, thank you so much for making sense of those banking numbers for us. But it's a good time to get a technical check on the markets. Mitesh Thakur of EarningsWaves.com joins us now. Mitesh, uh, good morning and uh, happy Diwali to you. Uh, I just want to understand that markets are currently, after that big pop-up that we saw yesterday, are the days low. It is one day before the monthly options expiry as well. Tomorrow we are not trading. Uh, what are the charts suggesting now? Will we see some volatility today? Good morning, Sonal. Uh, wish you a very happy Diwali and to the entire CMC family. Uh, my understanding is that 10,750, uh, 10,800 is an historical uh, supply pivot. So I think, you know, we've been talking about uh, targets around these levels and they are suggesting to take profits uh, 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 around these levels. I think that's playing out. The overall structure is negative, but I think, you know, after uh, the uh, rally which we've seen for the last few days, including the uh, big move up which happened yesterday evening, uh, it looks like that the Nifty will go through some kind of profit booking phase. So I think now the idea should be that traders should be looking at declines to buy into the index. Uh, around 10,700, 10,680 is my preferred buying zone and we are not very far away from there. Uh, just about, uh, I think we are trading right there in that uh, range. So I think around these levels, you know, uh, traders can look at possibly buying into the index with a stop below 10,610. So about 60, 65 point kind of risk which you have. And broadly, it could be a market which will just drop around for the next few days between this 10,650 to about 10,850 before eventually uh, going up. So my sense is be positive, but in the short term, uh, wait for some de declines, pullbacks to the short term averages to buy into the indices. Having said that, on the trading side, I have in fact long calls. Uh, metals and steel stocks are doing very well today. So Jinder Steel and Power is a breakout kind of a trade. Uh, buy here with the stock below levels of 445, look for targets of 475. And Maruti is also, you know, uh, showing very uh, positive price pattern in the short term on, on the short term charts. That's a buy as well. Uh, keep a stop below uh, levels of uh, 8840 here and look for targets of around uh, 9225 to begin with. Maybe even higher levels can be tested. Okay, all right. Uh, Mitesh, thanks a lot for that. So that's on Maruti, one of the stock ideas that he has. Uh, the market is not doing much, actually. It's uh, one of those days, you know, before a holiday, after a holiday. So I guess people are still on in holiday mode, uh, just trying to sort of get by with the day. Let's slip into a short break. Up next, we'll discuss the way forward for the market. We have N. Jay Kumar of Prime Securities joining in in just a while. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, well, for the market, not much happening today and I don't think anyone's expecting too much to happen considering that it's a holiday tomorrow and was a long weekend yesterday. But we have our first guest on the show, N. Jay Kumar, Managing Director at Prime Securities is with us. Uh, Jake's happy Diwali to you. Hope you have uh, the best one yet. Um, you know, we were speaking to so many experts and market men, market veterans in the last couple of days. I think what stood out for me is when Ramesh Damani said that this is a 10-year bull market that we're in and we're going to hit new highs in short, very short order. Uh, do you feel the same? Well, uh, for starters, a very, very happy Diwali and uh, you know, festival greetings to everyone. A great new year. And uh, just go back to my interview with you four weeks ago, where my exact words were, we'll either hit new highs in Q3 or latest Q4 of the current fiscal. So I'm happy that in some sense it's been 
reaffirmed the thought process. We may still not be right, but uh, reaffirmed in some sense by someone like a Ramesh Damani. So, uh, absolutely the same views. All right. Hi, Mr. Jay Kumar. Good morning and thanks for joining us. This is Pavitra. So, you know, what do you think the approach should be now? Do you think that, um, you know, every time you get a dip, it's a good time to buy some, uh, you know, to get into the ma uh, market or put some fresh money to play? And also in the past four weeks since we had you on, we've also got a lot of the earnings that have come through, a lot of tech, a lot of the banking names. So how are you looking at those as well? Uh, I think uh, clearly from a market perspective, I think it's... Uh, uh, aggressive buy on every dip, uh, not the least of the reasons being that our markets have been uh, sort of have been holding out. But the fact is that there are so many, not just geopolitical, overseas, local factors that have played out. I think this is an amazing confluence of, uh, it's, it's almost like a karmic confluence, if you will, of many, many factors. The fact that India has been once upon a time a manufacturing superpower, and today we have everything from a PLI initiative to China plus one or Taiwan plus one, as the case might be in certain cases. All of this is making a strong case for manufacturing to come back to India, both from domestic sourcing perspective and for international uh, um, and for exports. Number two, the fact that the rupee has weakened in line, exports are significantly better off, of course, to the extent that there are certain imports that many of these uh, industries have, there is a certain offset. But other than that, I think even geopolitically, I think people have found the domestic market as being hugely attractive for, uh, you know, uh, looking at people setting up shop here. I mean, I can just go on and on. These are factors that have been well enumerated. I think oil and commodities will come off quite sharply. There's talk uh, over the weekend and a whole bunch of WhatsApp forwards about how natural gas in the, future, in the cash market can actually go down to zero and below which means that the storage facilities are all full. People have been hoarding up. There's been massive, if you will, buyer's panic that has happened. So while Europe goes through its own set of issues, um, supply dislocation, issues in terms of uh, uh, unemployment, et cetera, the U.S. has been the only market that's kind of withstood it and has been able to keep unemployment at certainly decent levels. I think there is a natural sort of move to markets outside of these, which an India kind of shines out. And the goings on and the shenanigans in the, on the political front, as far as uh, China is concerned, has almost made it very, very clear that money will come here in preference to most of the markets, especially China. Uh, and that's true for FDI even more so than FIR. Okay, you know, someone would say that uh, now India's uh, valuations are very expensive vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Chinese market where, mar where valuations are dirt cheap. Do you think in that scenario it would impact FDI flows in some way? Someone would say that, okay, it is at a price, we're getting China at a price where we can actually put in money and we will get some better returns than India where valuations have shot through the roof. What, are, what is your take on that? If that was the case, then expensive stocks don't remain expensive in markets. And if in the overall sense, I think if you look at India and China as stocks in the international market, given the kind of political uh, fragility there is in China, I'm not too sure if people are going to go there and bottom fish. Of course, there will be people who will go, there will be domestic people who will, uh, who will sort of buy into those markets. My point here is that at the margin, there is more money coming into Indian markets, at least for the next you know, four to six years, compared to any other market in the world. Okay, India is an aggressive buy on every dip. I like that. That's, uh, that's the kind of optimism that we're looking out for, right, this Diwali. But um, I noticed that in your list of preferred sectors, you have a lot of the beaten down names, whether it's PSU banks, whether it's uh, capital goods. And this is a theme that stood out through the course of the last few days where people are preferring now, uh, you know, sectors that have been in a bear market for a long time. But my question to you is this, Jakes, even if you look at PSU banks, right, apart from an SBA, BI, all the other banks have, to be honest, not given returns to investors maybe in over a decade. So are these just trading cycles that you're looking at or are these investment opportunities as well? If we take the next two to three years, I think the top three uh, PSU banks will deliver returns significantly in excess of their uh, private sector counterparts. I think they will also give returns in excess of what the markets will give. Uh, some of these have been beaten down. They've been much talked about. I don't want to I mentioned top three, so you can kind of, uh, you know, you know where to extrapolate this 
in terms of stock specificity. Uh, I believe that there is no reason for some of these to continue quoting at 0.65 to 0.7 times book, which is true for the number two, number three, number four, et cetera. So that's not a trading theme. In fact, I rarely if ever give trading calls. Uh, this is a very uh, fundamental, uh, you know, uh, bottoms up kind of play. And some of these are quoting at two and three high. So I actually don't quite agree that they haven't given returns. Uh, number two, in terms of uh, uh, most of the uh, credit offtake, the PSU banks now have a significantly higher share of corporate credit offtake than has happened in the past. And I think that's another significant reason that there is growth in, in addition to their balance sheets having been cleaned up that I'm looking at. Okay, just one final question. Uh, what do you think of the entire IT pack? Of course, we've seen, you know, sharp corrections in all of these stocks, 30 to 50%. Do you think most of the damage is done? And, you know, perhaps these look attractive at the prices that we have now. Or do you think that, you know, you could see much further kind of cuts and it's best to avoid the space for a while? I wouldn't say there are uh, deeper cuts uh, uh, in, this, in, these, in the IT sector, for instance. I believe that the downside may be limited, but so too is the upside. I think these have uh, high amounts of cash, buybacks will continue. Uh, but I think business could get impacted because a lot of the markets where they've been operating are going through their own churn, Europe especially. So I personally believe that uh, this sector may have limited downside for sure, but the upside could be equally uh, uh, muted. Okay, all right, Mr. Jaikumar, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us and taking us through what the market fundamentals are looking like and your outlook on Indian equities as well. With that, we'll slip into a short break now. But before we do that, here's some great news for investors. You can now track the US market actions real time on Money Control. Log on to Money Control website or app and stay informed about all that matters in global markets. Welcome back. You're still watching Trading R, and let's bring you some interesting market opinion from earlier today. We caught up with Ajay Srivastava, who's CEO of Dimensions Corporate Financial Services, and he says that this may be the best time to enter the fixed income market. Listen in. It's a good summer this year, but only fact is, depending on from where you look at the whole market, it's like an economy is like a glass half full. You know, some people feel optimistic that, listen, the worst is behind us. Some people can feel pessimistic that the interest rate and inflation will come through and the demand is going down. So it just depends upon where you look from, which side of the market you look at it, it's, and you decide whether you want to be optimistic or pessimistic. But one thing we know for sure, and I think that's what the market has taught us, is that the paradigm of this long-term investment concept is gone now. I think you need to learn to be flexible, fast, nimble, and get out of stocks once they reach a good point of valuation from a comfortable point of view. This is the best time to allocate, and you have not done it, a lot of investors have not done it for a while, to go into fixed income. If fixed income will give a better return, it has given better return. If you look at five, seven years, it's given very good returns when you were in the last cycle of rate increases, and you rode the whole capital gain right up to the point where our post-COVID happened. I think the same cycle is happening. You will get better returns than equity markets broadly. And we've seen oversubscription of just now, we saw the bond subscribe at 7.9% interest for 25 years. Now, these kind of opportunities come once in a while. So there is a clear case that one needs to pedal down a little bit your equity inclination, no matter how exciting it looks, and move a lot of your money into the fixed income. And that's where they're given money. We didn't follow the Hong Kong model. Right. So therefore, our market cap of real estate companies has been minuscule compared to what happened in the magic period of Hong Kong or Singapore. And unfortunately, the companies in India have not given returns to shareholders. So it doesn't depend on the market, whether you invested in a DLF or a prestige or whatever. Your rate of returns have not been lucrative. Of course, one can argue that the macro tech has done good post the IPO. There's no doubt about it. But broadly, in a longer term time frame, for whatever reason, I'm not attributing any motives to it. But somehow the other, the shareholder never makes return. I think there are a lot of companies which are very undervalued in pharma space. 
to be honest, uh, so most companies have been valued at in a single digit PEs kind of stuff, and they will gain tremendously from ro ro rupee dollar depreciation. There is no doubt about it. Uh, but the caution here is that this this flower is like those, you know, I don't know the name of the flower, but which once blossoms once in 20 years, somewhere in Himalayas or something. This pharma is that like flower. You need to catch it at the once in 20 year phenomenon. Uh, yes, I was a great votary for pharma. We made good money. But then it became so sluggish, sluggish, sluggish that the return on capital employed became negative. Over the, if I look at last 20 years or 15 years, pharma has been the biggest loser in my portfolio in terms of return to capital employed. Okay, that's the word coming in from Ajay Srivastava. But lots of pearls of wisdom from our experts uh, in this summer session. Let's do one thing. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be joined by G.S. Chalal, the Chief Financial Officer at Make Money Organics, to discuss uh, the company's Q2 earnings. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, Make Money Organics is in focus. The company reported a mix set of numbers. Revenue growth was at 20%, but it was a margin miss this time around, led by the agrochemical segment. Pigment margin improved on a YY basis. G.S. Chahal, the CFO of Make Money Organics, is joining us now to discuss the earnings fine print and the outlook going forward. Mr. Chahal, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining us. And the Wali greetings to you and everyone at the company as well. Uh, you know, you had a busy weekend, the earnings as well as the uh, investor presentation as well. Uh, what stood out was was the pigment business where we have seen a YY increase in margins. Uh, however, it's still lower than the all-time highs that you've seen, around 15%. Uh, what is happening here? Do you expect continuous improvement in pigment margins from here on since crude prices, they are at stable levels now? Yeah, good morning. I wish you and the entire CNBC team a very <laughs> happy Diwali. And uh, to all the viewers of CNBC, uh, as far as uh, results are concerned, so uh, our uh, quarter two results are uh, as per the expected lines, which we have uh, uh, already stated. Uh, we expected a beta margin uh, contracting between 2 to 3 percent, but uh, against 14 percent of beta margin, we are at 13 percent uh, for the quarter two. And uh, going forward, we are seeing uh, positivity from in the coming quarter. I think uh, from the next calendar year, uh, globally, we may see the pickup uh, in the demand. And uh, results on the overall basis, we will see the improvement uh, now in the coming quarter. Uh, spe specifically for the pigments business, you will be getting back to the margin levels that you saw earlier? Like, is there continuous improvement there? Yeah, in case of pigment region, normally an orbital margin which remained in the range of uh, 12 to 14 percent. But this year it is uh, around uh, 9 and uh, 10 percent. So on the ERL basis, we are seeing in this range this year at least. And uh, going forward now, uh, overall a bit of margin pigment division, once uh, this our new project will also get commission in by December, uh, uh, titanium dioxide. So from the next year, we will uh, see the improvement uh, in a bit of margin. Can you tell us, uh, Mr. Chahal, what exactly is the current exposure that you have particularly to Europe as well as to the US? And uh, given the kind of, uh, you know, problems that uh, we're facing in Europe with the energy crisis, uh, do you think that there could be more challenges to your business? Uh, uh, if we see overall exposure, we have now two businesses. One is agro and second is pigment. In agro division, uh, the total top line comes two third is coming from agro, while one third is from the pigment. Uh, exposure in agro division, we have hardly uh, two to three percent in Europe. While in case of pigment, we have 10 to 12 percent uh, exposure to the euro. Uh, definitely, uh, the impact, that is the impact. On the other side, uh, uh, which we have now our foreign currency, which we had in uh, uh, euro, so which we took uh, our uh, funding at the rate of 89 at that time. So that is the gain which is coming up uh, in our uh, foreign currency. Okay, good morning, Mr. Chahil. Uh, so, you know, you spoke about the pigments business. If I can come to the agrochemicals uh, business right now, you did see a margin hit this time. It's coming at around 16% uh, versus the over 19% that you saw earlier. So, can you tell us what really went wrong over here and uh, do you expect it to come back to that 1920 kind of uh, level soon? Yeah, definitely in case of agrochemical, as we said, the price, there was a pressure on the prices where the finished good prices uh, went down uh, for the major molecules like 5 and uh, 240. Uh, while the raw material uh, which was there in the pipeline, so that is getting consumed over a period in the two to three months. 
So when we say rising pricing trend, so that benefit is uh, uh, taken uh, immediately. While then the downtrend in the price, so that is the impact which gets passed on for the uh, two, three years uh, till the time the uh, average inventory, which is of the highest cost, gets consumed. But by next month, uh, by end of uh, next quarter, so that inventory is getting consumed. So then again, uh, it will start, uh, margin will start improving. And uh, overall uh, annualized basis, whatever guidance we have given between 17 to 19 percent, uh, we will be uh, in, the uh, in the range. Okay. So that is about the PNL. I wanted to understand what your receivables are from Make Money Fine Chem. Now most of their capex is done as well. You expect uh, this money to uh, flow in faster than you had expected, and by how much? Uh, receivable from uh, Make Money for the renewable preference share you are talking about. Mr. Chahal, are there any outstanding yeah. receivables from Make Money Fine Chem? Make money fine cam uh, uh, in the normal operation there is yes. no outstanding. There is no. only receivable yes. which is the uh, redeemable preference here which is uh, 212 crore was there. So company has uh, make money fine cam has paid 12 crore in September and uh, guidance is again uh, we will uh, uh, redeem the entire uh, uh, payment of, of 200 crore uh, in less than 5 years. Okay. You've also forayed into the titanium dioxide business. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Have prices fallen? When will it start contributing to your PNL? And uh, will you wait a bit before you start production? Uh, titanium dioxide, as you know, uh, uh, we acquired Kilburn Chemicals in the quarter three of uh, uh, 21, December 21. And uh, uh, that uh, first phase uh, we are going to commission by end of December. And it will start, and uh, then the capacity ramp up will start, and uh, significantly it will start contributing from uh, next year uh, in the top line. So that is the way it is going to happen uh, in case of uh, titanium dioxide. Okay, got that. Uh, sir, just uh, one question on the new pigments plant. We know that phase one was supposed to be, uh, you know, it's supposed to come on stream by Q3. So can you take us through what the initial capacity utilization will be for that plant? And also for phase two of this, when are you expecting that to come on stream? Yes. Uh, phase one, which will be a capacity of 16,500 tons per annum. And we see because uh, customer approval will take two to three months. And uh, this uh, will uh, capacity wrap up going to happen from April onwards. And first year we are expecting anywhere between 50 to 60 percent capacity utilization. Next year, 23-24, and uh, by uh, quarter three of uh, FY24, uh, we will be commissioning the second phase, which will take the total capacity from uh, 16,500 to 33,000 tons. And uh, uh, then that will start contributing from the uh, next year. Okay. Mr. Chahal, last question before we let you go. I was reading the press release that there has been a fire at one of your pigment manufacturing plants. And this is something which is the third fire that you've seen in the last six years. What is happening here? And in this particular case, will there be any production loss or uh, revenue hit that you'll take? Yeah, this was an unfortunate uh, event which has uh, happened uh, on 22nd uh, night. And uh, in one of our uh, finished goods go down in the haze. Uh, manufacturing plant, uh, fire fire has occurred, and uh, we have thrown three manufacturing sites uh, for the pigment division, and this is in the finished goods warehouse, and uh, there is no loss, uh, human loss, uh, are, uh, uh, and to the uh, machinery, and the, uh, all the plants are safe. So uh, it will be start immediately once uh, the approval from the statutory authorities will be there, and there will not be any impact on the production. All right, uh, Mr. Chahal, thanks a lot for joining in and giving us an update on the business. That's Make Money Organics. It's been under pressure, down almost 20% in the last three months. But it is curtains down on this edition of Trading Hour. Don't go anywhere from the entire team. Thanks a lot for watching. Halftime Report comes up in just minutes from now.